Okay. Great. So it looks like we are recording. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Eileen Corcoran. I'm the Community Outreach Manager at the Vermont Historical Society. Uh, I'm super excited to see everybody here today. Uh, some, some regular faces and some new folks uh, joining us. Um, and this is officially part of, of the work that we do with and for what we call the League of Local Historical Societies and Museums at VHS, which is sort of an informal grouping of everybody who works in historical societies and museums and other organizations in Vermont um, that wants to talk about uh, sort of what we do together. So this is the first of three. Uh, a lot of you folks have already signed up for our February and March uh, roundtables, uh, but if you haven't, uh, feel free to find the information on those on our website, vermonthistory.org. And just a few quick technical notes before I turn it over to Paul and Marjorie. Um, again, sort of most of you already are, but we please do ask that you mute if you aren't actively speaking so we can keep background noise to a minimum. Uh, we welcome you to ask questions and use the chat for sharing resources um, or, or answering something about if somebody's asking about things that we all do. Uh, the chat is a wonderful tool for that. If you'd like to speak, um, you know, via via sort of the live video, uh, if you know you want to sort of get in line, we definitely recommend using the sort of raise your hand option on Zoom just so we can know and see uh, that you're interested in speaking. Again, we do have a fairly decent crowd, so it's sometimes hard to see everybody. So we recommend making the little Zoom, the Zoom emoji go uh, to let us know you have uh, some input you'd like to ask or add. But again, this is a round table. So we'll be talking a little bit about what VHS does, but we also hope that we'll get to share uh, questions and what other people are doing um, and sort of talk talk together about, about how, we can, how we can work on our digital collections and sharing history resources. So with that, uh, I think we're gonna turn it over. I'm gonna turn it over to Paul and Marjorie. Uh, to start us off. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, as Eileen said, this is going to be a, uh, a round table. It's not a, uh, a workshop where we're going to uh, give any sort of uh, formal presentation or uh, tell you uh, how you should go about digitizing your collections. Um, however, I thought I would start out with showing you um, one uh, project that we're working on. It's sort of our digital platform. And um, you might be able to get some ideas from that, have some suggestions uh, for us, um, or otherwise have some uh, reactions to, uh, to what we're doing. I should say that our um, use of digital resources has evolved over the years. Um, we used to put a lot of things up on Flickr because it was uh, easy and um, easily available. Um, we still have a lot of our um, uh, yeah. glass plate negatives uh, scanned and on, on Flickr, uh, but we really haven't added anything to Flickr in quite a while. Uh, those collections are linked from our website and uh, from our main website. Uh, and I, can, uh, I should probably show you that, uh, that page as well. Um, just to give you an idea of how we, uh, we believe people are entering into our digital collections. Of course, um, yeah. it's always something of a, uh, of a gamble to uh, try to figure out how people are actually uh, using your collections. So I am going to try to uh, share my screen right now. Um, and here we go. Let's see if this works. Yeah share. Okay, so this is our digital Vermont site. Um, I guess I should back up a step and see if I can pull up. Who's that guy? Is it Mike Manahan? Mm -hmm. He came in last week or week before. And, uh, I think someone's microphone is on. I'm getting one, He wanted me to chat with him. Okay, I'm still here. Uh, so this is our main, uh, our main website, uh, vermonthistory.org. We have a drop down menu under discover and we have a page under digital resources. 
Uh, and this is where we have tried to uh, pull together uh, a variety of our digital resources. Uh, we've got all sorts of different projects going. So it's um, a, a bit of a, uh, uh, a large grouping, uh, but it all sort of launches from here. Um, and we have just one link to, uh, to Digital Vermont and then a few other um, links to specific uh, collections within Digital Vermont. Uh, we've also been trying something new, a couple of databases built on a uh, cataloging, a museum cataloging database called Catalog It. Um, and we've created a women's history database. This is a re, um, uh, reinstallation of an older um, women's history database that we had many years ago, as well as a new one on uh, Vermont uh, black history. Uh, let me switch over to digital Vermont and just show you briefly that this is the, uh, the homepage where we've um, uh, sort of calling out some of the, uh, the newer um, collections that we've created. Uh, one is about Governor Kunin, um, based around her inaugural gowns, um, but also um, other artifacts that uh, relate to her tenure, her political career. Uh, and we're also doing a new one uh, on political broadsides and posters. Uh, you can get an idea of the array of collections that we've started putting up uh, on the collections page. Um, it's getting a little, uh, a little crowded now. Uh, we've broken things up into subject collections, which <coughs> may not be the way to go. Uh, this may be something that we need to be um, re-examining. Um, and I'll just quickly show you what one collection looks like. Um, this is our collection of Easterly daguerreotypes. Uh, starts out with a description of the collection, sort of an introduction. Uh, the button over here to the right is view all items. Um, and then there's a summary view of the photographs. Um, you can click on one and see the scan of the daguerreotype. And this is what we would call the, the metadata, uh, the cataloging information uh, for, the, um, for the photograph uh, formatted in a very particular way. This is running on a uh, platform called Omeka. Uh, it's an open source um, database uh, that can either be hosted by your own institution or hosted by, um, by other institutions. Uh, or hosted by the company, uh, you pay them a fee to host it. Uh, let me just take a look and see how, if our uh, women's history database is working properly. Um, so this is sort of an example of a um, website that's pulling data from a, uh, from a cataloging database, from a museum collections database. Um, we worked with a um, programmer to uh, make this interface possible. Uh, and this is the, uh, the, this is the metadata for this particular database. Uh, Gaylene Aiken, a uh, folk artist uh, from this part of the, uh, the state. Um, and you can uh, see uh, Julia Alvarez similarly uh, this is running off a program, as I said, called um, Catalog It. So that's uh, just a quick overview of uh, some of what we've been doing uh, to digitize some of our collections. I was focusing on photographs. Of course, um, that's not the only thing that uh, one can digitize. Um, I saw in the chat that some people are doing um, uh, yearbooks and uh, town reports and uh, all sorts of uh, print material as well as photographs. Um, so it'd be nice to, uh, to talk about some of the different um, formats that people are doing. Uh, what you found is the, uh, the easiest way to 
to get them out there to the public, whether you're using a, uh, a website or a dedicated uh, digital archive platform like Omeka. Um, love to hear what people are doing and what sort of questions uh, you might have. Can we speak or are we supposed to write? You can go ahead and speak right now. That'd be fine. Okay. This, this is Kay Schluter. Uh, I had a question come up. Uh, I brought the question up recently at the Northfield Historical Society board meeting. I have been scanning the Rambler, which is Northfield High School's yearbook, which started in 1921 and posting them on our website. Now, when you go back that far, the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s, and maybe even into the 50s, there doesn't, I don't think there would be an issue with um, privacy. But, uh, and our website does go into the 90s. Um, I was wondering what the, I don't know, the, the legal and ethical question is, should you continue or should I continue to post uh, uh, full text, uh, searchable full text yearbooks on our website uh, into the 90s and even now into the 2020s? Um, we're looking into copyright issues in the past. That hasn't been a problem because they've been so old and, and most people are have since are gone from from the uh, those yearbooks, but um, as we get into more recent times, uh, what would be the protocol or what would be appropriate for putting that type of thing on the internet without actually getting permission from people in the yearbook or even the high school itself? What are people doing about uh, modern yearbooks? I know there are a lot of uh, yearbook projects out there. Um, I don't know, is, uh, is Virgil from uh, Rockingham Public Library here? Uh, Virgil Fuller, I know he's done a bunch of them. Um, I know that yearbooks are available on uh, commercial sites such as uh, Ancestry.com. Um, I haven't looked in to see if they've got a cutoff uh, but that might be a model we could follow. Um, Has anybody run into any copyright issues with the more recent um, yearbooks, feeling that they needed to get copyright? Because this is sort of one of those quasi documents where it's, it's, uh, it's public, yet it's not like commercially available. You can't walk into a, a most bookstores, you know, and pick up a copy of, of some high school yearbook. Um, Who holds the copyright? That's the issue probably. Yes. And um, I'm, I don't know about the more, more recent ones. I have to look in, but in the older ones, even in the nineties, I never saw any sort of copyright statement. So I guess I'd have to contact the high school to find out. Um, I see that that Beth Cannell has her hand raised. Beth? I want to reply as an author, Kay. Copyright applies right away whether there's a symbol or not. Copyright law has changed. Mm -hmm. So I think you do need to ask the school for permission. And then it's mm -hmm. up to the school whether they've asked individuals for permission to put their photos in there. I think there would probably be legally an assumed permission since people get to check off whether their photos are going to be shown or not. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you need to contact individuals. The one thing I do want to raise as a red flag for, though, is complete things, complete poems, complete letters, complete stories. Um, they are the property of the author for lifetime plus another 70 years. And I've already had problems online when, at the beginning, kind of innocently, I posted a full uh, poem from a European poet who immediately got in touch and said, take it down. You have no right to do that. So watch out for complete documents and especially ask for permission for those and um, watch the copyright years on things like Robert Frost's poetry, which I think is now public domain. Can someone confirm that? 
but yes, it's public now, I believe. Okay. But but some of the ones, Galway Canal's poems, for instance, would not be public domain yet. Oh, that's that's um, good to know. Um, of the fact that um, if they students gave their permission to be in the yearbook. Uh, I graduated too long ago. I don't remember giving permission. It was just assumed that you were going to be in the yearbook. So, uh, but maybe things have changed uh, with uh, privacy laws, uh, uh, people who are, um, uh, people who are trying to impersonate you or somehow steal your identity. You know, we didn't have that back in the 60s <laughs> like we do now. So that, thank you very much for that. Hi, uh, Kay and everybody. This is Erica Donis. I um, work for Champlain College on the Champlain College Archivist, and I've had pretty extensive conversations with our legal counsel about um, images of students, including those in our college yearbooks. And this is kind of a gray area that we've that we're all touching upon here in terms of privacy and confidentiality. So you have to think about the federal education. Privacy Rights Act, which applies to student records. Um, there is a clause in FERPA that says that quote unquote directory information, such as that is typically included in a yearbook, like uh, a, a photo, a major, a hometown, um, qualifies as public information that doesn't necessarily need direct permission from the individual student. But images of a student perhaps in a athletic team shot or on a drama club or something along those lines is different, um, at least according to our legal counsel's interpretation. So um, because we haven't asked at Champlain College, we didn't start asking for explicit permission from students to share their images until I think something like 2016 we have this huge gray area where um, alumni, alumni might still be alive, where we've decided not to share things publicly online. So our agreement, my agreement with the, the legal counsel is that um, the, that 85 years need to have passed in terms of a, um, a possible life expectancy of a person. So you want to, um, you know, do the math back from the year of the yearbook. If mm. it's a senior picture who might be 18 years old, you know, figure out how old they might be today and go from there. At least if you want to use the advice of uh, Champlain's legal counsel. Thank you very much. I hope that helps. Yeah, it does. It, it, it uh, opens up some uh, information I didn't know about. So thank you very much. So I'll just uh, comment that uh, Alexander uh, posted a link to uh, eCommons at uh, Cornell. Uh, I don't, I'm not, I haven't clicked through on that, so I can't tell you what it says, um, but uh, that's there in the, um, in the chat. Uh, also, Fred is saying that he was browsing on UVM Special Collections site, and they, on the other hand, have yearbooks available. Uh, what's the most recent one, Fred, that they have available? And then we'll get to Beth in just a minute. Fred, do you know how, what the most recent? No, you got to unmute yourself. Nope, not sure. Okay. Um, so this is definitely, I think this is definitely an issue that uh, archivists around the country are dealing with, uh, as well as the genealogy sites, because uh, these um, yearbooks are incredibly popular. Um, and I think making the, um, the distinction between a directory information and a, um, a sports picture makes it pretty hard to, um, to separate out. You'd sort of have to digitize just certain pages and not others, um, which uh, certainly the commercial, um, uh, the commercial genealogy sites, uh, I don't believe that they are making that distinction. Okay, Beth, what would you like to add? bringing it back up to the current time. In Waterford, the school gives to all students, and I'm assuming this happens statewide, um, or gives to their parents, a document at the beginning of the school year that specifies whether they're allowed to have their photographs shown in public or not. 
and teachers then have the responsibility for that. So if, you, if your historical society is doing something with the school, it's up to the teacher to separate the kids who should not be photographed while you're doing the event. I think that's useful because a lot of us are trying to collaborate with the schools to strengthen the position of the historical societies. Anybody else having school events and come across that yet? Okay. Um, someone wants, uh, Bob wants to talk about newspaper copyright. Um, yeah. I don't know that we're copyright experts here, but Bob, <laughs> did you have something you wanted to? Uh... Oh, and, uh, I've run across this a lot when you have a, a um, set of newspapers from, say, Bennington or whatever town, and you want to digitalize them and um, have them available to search. Um, I've run across a gamut of answers to, is it legal to do it from a copyright standpoint? There's a guy in central New York who's digitalized literally millions of pages of newspapers and they're available on the internet, FultonHistory.com. He does it, no problem. And other people seem to be hesitant to, to uh, digitalize newspapers uh, for various copyright or I guess uh, business product or if you call it. Or uh, So it's kind of, um, I've got a lot of different answers on that. And my feeling is that they're, they're all fair game up to the present day. Okay, is anyone uh, digitizing newspapers on your own? Anyone undertaking a big project like that? I mean, that, that creates all sorts of um, uh, uh, logistical questions as well as uh, copyright. Uh, and maybe the logistic questions uh, outweigh the, the copyright and people just don't don't undertake it. I could see digitizing uh, small uh, runs of newsletters, maybe even community newsletters. Um, digitizing runs of newspapers uh, can be uh, quite a quite a task. Yeah, you've got it. You've got to assign it to somebody who's got the equipment and somebody who just just does that. And that uh, this guy in Central New York, FultonHistory.com. Check him out on the internet. He's done millions of pages of newspapers. I will just um, throw in here, since we're talking about newspapers, that uh, there is a growing body of Vermont newspapers available on newspapers.com, uh, thanks to the uh, state archives and an arrangement with um, ancestry.com, which owns newspapers.com. Um, and you can, get, um, you can get access to Vermont newspapers for free. It's a little clunky. Uh, the search interface, I don't believe, is exactly the uh, same as what you would get if you subscribe to newspapers.com yourself. Um, but the arrangement with, the, um, with Ancestry is that Vermonters get free access to those newspapers. Uh, so as I'm sure most of the people on this call realize that um, this is really opening up uh, Vermont research in a, in a big way. Um, these newspapers are just incredibly valuable and it's uh, possible to, um, uh, to learn a lot that we haven't known about before. Um, of course, you've got to, you're, you're relying on the, the quality of the newspapers from the past. So <laughs> there's still, it doesn't replace uh, original research in other ways, but uh, it gives us a lot of information on a lot of folks that there isn't, um, there isn't a lot of um, access to. Um, so uh, just to finish up on the, the copyright um, issue, Fred reports that uh, UVM's got uh, yearbooks right through 1998 on their website. Um, so maybe we'll reach out to um, Chris Burns at UVM and uh, I think Eileen's gonna be sending out a follow-up document uh, with some links and things like that. So we'll reach out to Chris and uh, see what his, um, uh, what their, their policies are and what they've learned about what's what's under copyright and what isn't. Okay, uh, let's see. What would people else like to? Uh, someone's asking about uh, standards for creating metadata uh, and for scanning glass plate negatives. What are the recommendations? Oh boy. Okay. Uh, um, Let's see. So metadata and uh, the actual scanning of the uh, the object are two different categories. 
Um, I'll start with glass plate negatives. Um, what we do here is put it on a transparency scanner. That is a scanner that has a light in the cover and shows down on the, uh, through the, um, the glass plate negative rather than uh, reflecting off of the negative. You'd use a reflective scanner for a photographic print. You'd use a transparency scanner for a negative of any kind. Um, so uh, usually I think the um, uh, best practices is to uh, you know, scan it once and save it as a higher resolution um, uh, file. And then you can always uh, downgrade it for use on the web. So uh, usually save your first scan as a TIFF format and um, scan it at 400 or 600 DPI. Um, and then if you want to put it on the web, uh, resave that as a JPEG at a lower resolution, 300 or 200. Um, and um, and then you've got two, at least two versions of your, uh, of your glass plate negative. Um, now, the discussion of uh, DPI has to um, recognize that it is relative to the size of the original. Uh, so it's dots per inch. Uh, so you're not going to get the same uh, quality uh, for something that's 600 DPI um, that's very small, that's two by two, as you would if you scan something at 600 DPI at eight by 10. So um, we'll be sending out some links to some, um, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, handbooks, um, standards that uh, other people have developed. Um, and um, you'll see, uh, I think in, uh, I think UVM's uh, standards, the, the scanning density is relative to, it depends on the, uh, the size of the original. Okay, so they've got one standard for small things, another standard for larger things, uh, because if you're scanning a, uh, an eight by 10 glass plate at 600 DPI TIFF, you're gonna have a uh, pretty large file and you may decide that you don't really need that, uh, particularly if it's you know a cat or a dog or something like that. Um, so that's, um, those are one um, sort of rule of thumb. Um, on glass plate negatives. Does anyone have any questions about glass plate negatives since we've sort of introduced that topic? Um, I'll just say while I'm waiting for a question to pop up that glass plate negatives are really a very satisfying um, project. Um, they are uh, often very sharp uh, because they're large format and uh, it's, uh, it's out of copyright, <laughs> we're sure of that. Uh, and uh, you can get some pretty amazing views of, uh, of your town from glass plate negatives. So uh, if you don't have, uh, if you haven't undertaken a glass plate negative project yet and you've got some sitting around, uh, that's good to do. Um, one thing I would say, what we generally do is uh, clean off the uh, non-emulsion side, uh, that is the shiny side with some uh, distilled water and a clean rag. Uh, you don't wanna mess with the emulsion side. So you gotta hold it up to the light and the dull side is where the emulsion has been applied to the plate. You don't wanna be, um, uh, rubbing that, uh, but on the, the, the glass side, the shiny side, the non-emulsion side, uh, you can clean that up a little bit before you scan it. Uh, you're going to want to handle it by the edges, of course, uh, and you're going to want to store it in a, um, in a paper sleeve. Uh, the commercial uh, archival supply places have four fold pla uh, paper sleeves. Uh, that's going to keep the, the glass plate from rubbing against the other glass plates in the boxes. Um, usually we store glass plate negatives uh, on their narrow edge upright in a, an archival box um, designed for that purpose. I think most of the uh, manuals uh, suggest not piling them on top of each other. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the physics 
there is, but I think because you're adding weight, I think that's because you're, you're putting weight on the, the lowest glass plate and that's not a good idea. Um, let's see, what else was I gonna say about glass plate negatives? Oh, the, um, another thing you might wanna consider is you're considering uh, scanning projects and it sort of comes to mind with glass plate negatives is a uh, sort of what I would call a, uh, a linking mechanism, a, uh, a manual linking mechanism to, to, to link the scan to the, your original. Um, you want to be able to move back and forth between the original plate and the, uh, the digital file. Um, here at the VHS, we just use a very simple uh, straight numbering system. Um, sequential numbers um, keep it pretty simple. Um, we keep, and I think it's probably a good idea to keep your glass plate negatives sorted by size uh, because you don't want to be stacking big glass plates on, uh, on small ones or vice versa. Um, so um, we have a, a letter code for, uh, for the different sizes and then just a sequential number. Um, and then everything else um, uh, generates off of that number. Uh, so if you wanna keep track of the plates of a particular photographer, you just have a table or a spreadsheet that says that uh, you know, John Brown's um, glass plate negatives are one through 55. Um, and you put that, uh, that glass plate negative number in the, um, the, file, uh, the file name uh, for, the, uh, for the digital file so that you know that that is a scan of glass plate A1, for instance. Um, and so that's the beginning of a discussion of metadata, perhaps. Um, the, the simplest uh, form of metadata I would suggest is your, uh, your file name. Um, and so uh, in our case, as I said, we use the, um, the, uh, the number of the plate. And then we make up a um, short um, readable description of what it is, you know, man on horse, um, Spalding High School, um, something that we can use to, um, to search our hard drive for, um, use a, uh, a keyword search. Um, I mean, you could develop a more uh, sophisticated um, approach. You could use the number and then the photographer's name and then an underscore and then the, um, uh, the, sub, the keywords that you're assigned to it. Uh, I would suggest using uh, underscores, not, um, uh, not spaces. Spaces can look uh, strange and wondrous in uh, HTML if you're uh, pulling those, um, uh, those file names up. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of rules of thumb on that. Obviously you don't wanna use um, periods in your file names, except when you're using the file extension, uh, cause that can do weird things um, to, your, um, to your file names and the way that the file is read by certain systems, uh, particularly uh, Windows. Uh, let's see. Uh, so the rest of metadata is, um, it's a big topic. I mean, metadata is sort of equals cataloging. Uh, there are national standards um, on our Digital Vermont site. We are using something that's called Dublin Core, which is a, um, a schema, I guess you could say, for uh, descriptive data. Um, it's a little easier and lighter than some other schemes. Um, we come from the uh, library world. So uh, we're used to dealing with things like um, the mark, uh, mark cataloging for books, uh, which is very structured and very rigid. Um, Dublin Core is more, more um, flexible um, within certain parameters. Uh, it uses um, certain uh, field labels, and then um, uh, there are certain rules on what you can use in those, um, in those fields. Uh, but you've got to figure out a way to attach that metadata to your, um, to your uh, image, to your digital file. Uh, and that's sort of a big question. Usually it's attached in a, um, in a program 
such as um, Omeka that we're using, um, but, uh, or Pass Perfect. So Pass Perfect, you've got your digital file, right? And then you've got your cataloging data and that's the metadata. Um, and so usually in the cataloging record, you have a file name and that's how you know that the metadata goes to the, um, the image. Um, there are things, and I think we'll send out a, um, I think I came up with some links. There's a uh, Adobe product called Lightroom, I believe, and all sorts of Adobe suites where you can more intrinsically link the metadata to the image so that the metadata moves with the image. Um, maybe someone wants to, um, to jump in here and talk about how you are attaching your metadata to your, um, to your digital resources. Because I've been talking a lot. I'm just scanning the chat here to see if there's anything I want to um, uh, highlight it. Well, and it says it sounds a little like we might need a, a workshop on metadata <laughs> if people are. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> metadata would be something for for a workshop. Um, you know, at its very simplest, uh, metadata is a, a spreadsheet. Um, you know, your columns are fields, your rows are um, particular objects, uh, and how you put the information into those uh, cells is your collection of, uh, of metadata. So Paul, it's looking like in the chat, there's a lot of talk about, of course, the other giant uh, question, which is platforms and software. So I don't know if we want to pivot a little bit to, to try and talk about that. And I think maybe, um, you know, some good questions and discussion of what people are using or what should we be using. Um, we have a big question right now. We're talking with, with sort of folks at the statewide level of would a consortial or sort of shared platform or software uh, be of interest to people or be something that, that folks are looking for? And I guess I'll put that out there as, as a question for people to, to say, sure, or I wanna do my own thing. So what we're talking about uh, a little more is that um, in some states, they have a statewide digital archive. Um, in fact, many states, uh, Vermont, we haven't been able to uh, pull ourselves together to do such a thing. Um, but if you just Google uh, New Hampshire or Maine, Maine has had one for a long time. Uh, Massachusetts has something called the uh, Digital Commonwealth. Um, and um, we're wondering if uh, we can um, pull together a, uh, a planning grant to start, uh, to start thinking about this. Um, the, the upside is that um, everyone, that, that people would have a platform, that organizations would have a platform that you wouldn't have to maintain yourself. Um, and scholars or researchers or what, whatever uh, would find everything in one place. Uh, the downside is you'd have to follow the, um, <laughs> the standards that this organization uh, um, sets forth for how you, you put things up. Um, and you would then, uh, and all your stuff would be mixed in with other, other towns. Uh, so the searching capability then becomes very important because you may want to limit to Northfield or Norwich or what have you. Uh, so there can be advantages to individual databases where everything is right there, particularly for people within a town. Um, you know, the resident of Northfield may just be interested in just uh, scrolling through photos of Northfield someday um, and uh, sort of plowing through uh, everyone else's images is not, not uh, attractive. Okay, I think Beth was first and um, I saw one other come up, but it's disappeared. Beth? We've, I've actually been asking Rachel Onuf for a while to think about getting us, setting up a state flying squad that would do some of the things that are expensive to do locally. And scanning certainly one of them. Um, we're all, I think, building our scanning capacity as individuals and sometimes as historical societies. But to have 
a joint platform and a joint um, preference for things would be useful, I think. And I think it would be very simple for towns to say, well, these images are limited to our town only and these images are shared. That just be part of the original access. But the other flying squad I'm desperate to see from the state level is one for recording oral history. Um, we're doing it in Waterford and we've cobbled together a couple of different ways. But I think if, if we had a technical squad on the state level that could say, well, let's get the stories of all the 90 year olds this year before they're gone, um, that would be really useful. And it would bring us to a shared standard as well as getting this done. Thank you. Alexander, did you wanna chime in? Well, just uh, coming from the from the research side of it, I was gonna agree with what you just said a minute ago about the fact that a shared platform is, I think, gonna make it a lot easier, especially if you're not a Vermonter. I mean, fortunately, I'm, I'm living right here in the state, so I'm, I'm familiar with some of the historical societies, but if you're coming from out of state and you're curious to do research on Vermont and you're looking for materials on a certain town, it could become sort of a hunt and peck situation where you're trying to learn about all the different websites that contain various repositories as opposed to knowing there's one big site that collates everything. Plus, one thing we haven't mentioned, but I suppose would also be a consideration is security. I mean, if you're hosting your own site, if you don't maintain the virus, I'm thinking like WordPress, for example, does their own virus protection. If your site got hacked or perhaps if someone working on the site, if they moved or couldn't work on it anymore and it fell into disrepair, right? Because it, they didn't maintain the subscription or something. There are all these considerations. So yeah, I think a you know, broader site might be a more efficient way of doing it, but just my two. Thank you. Any other thoughts on a digital, um, statewide digital? Uh... Yeah, one thing in the uh... I know in New York, they were doing something for a while. They were purchasing like a flatbed scanner or some kind of fancy scanner system. And they were sharing the equipment, maybe not the personnel, but sharing the equipment and sending it around the state so people could you know, digitalize collections. And then when they're done, pack it up and send it along to the next. But that was a pretty cool idea. Yeah, I think the technical side is, is important and of course the biggest thing is the metadata because if you don't have that you can't find it so you can have all these beautiful images we have a, a, a hard drive filled with images <laughs> that are not easy to find um, unless you attach metadata to it or have a system that can search the metadata so that's one of the arguments for the larger system um, because it's really hard for small repositories i think to maintain a system like that. Um, it is dependent on volunteers, so. Well, when you were talking, talking about the statewide platform, uh, are you talking about Preservica? Perhaps, uh, this is a, um, a uh, platform, a company, what have you, uh, that uh, particularly Rachel Onuf, who's mentioned uh, a few moments ago, uh, who works for the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, Vasara, has been uh, exploring and uh, playing with. Um, not entirely sure that it works well for uh, local historical societies. Um, it comes out of the uh, records management world uh, and seems uh, particularly suited for, for that. Um, the, um, we don't really have a, a platform in mind. I mean, there are other platforms out there as well. Um, one from um, OCLC that um, is called Escaping Me at the Moment, Marjorie Content Held. Content DM. It's Content, content DM. DM. Yeah. Uh, that some of the universities are using. I think uh, Norwich University uses it and uh, St. Michael's, I believe. And Middlebury. Uh, and Middlebury. Um, and that seems particularly um, well suited to consortial arrangements. Um, uh, so that might be a leading candidate. Uh, UVM is using something called Islandora, uh, which might be another leading candidate. Um, so it's not anything that we've, um, uh, you know, settled on or um, figured out yet. 
Uh, do you have experience with it, um, Wiz? I do not. Planning grant. <laughs> but in my mind, uh, such as it is, I make a distinction between a public platform like Content DM, or I see somebody mentioned Omika uh, and like that, and something like Preservica, which is really designed to create a trustworthy digital repository. That once you've started scanning stuff, you're you've got electronic records to deal with. And they, if you've ever lost stuff because you had a hard, hard drive crash, you understand that electronic records are extraordinarily fragile, much more fragile than, than paper documents. And so having a standard TDR for the state to share, I think is extremely valuable. It also makes it possible for us as local repositories to start collecting electronic records and having some place to put them, you know, the business records, the, the electronic records that we all live by, emails and stuff like that, and having them someplace keep them that you know they're gonna last as opposed to putting them on a, a, a DVD drive and then, you know, 50 years from now, somebody wonders what this is all about. Um, and I don't know if you're making a distinction between the public access platform like Content DM and a long-term preservation platform, I don't think they necessarily have to be the same thing. It would be really convenient if they were, but the software development is really two different focuses and therefore sets of functionality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not sure it's a either or, it may be in parallel as, as you're saying. Um, we're certainly looking at Preservica, actually just even for ourselves to start <laughs> to see how it works. Um, but I do think that, that applying for a planning grant is sort of the key to begin with, because these questions will come up. So maybe we should. <laughs> Go for it. So, and then um, Kay also, uh, uh, suggests that uh, might be useful to separate local societies from larger academic or commercial organizations. Um, so yeah, we definitely see our role as working with local societies um, to try to um, uh, help you guys out and help ourselves out. Um, we certainly recognize that people like uh, UVM have their own resources and uh, we need to be careful to um, make it so that information can be harvested from different databases, but it's not necessary that they all be living together. And certainly UVM is uh, going off on their own. Norwich has their, their ways. Um, and so we would be looking to do something with, uh, with local societies and libraries um, would be our, our focus. So I think we've got about, uh, what, we've got about 10 minutes left uh, if we cut off at one. Um, and we can keep talking about these same topics or uh, people may have some other things that they've been um, wanting to ask. Now would be the time to, uh, to bring that up before we run out of time. I see Alexander's got his hand up. Yes. Well, this is on a bit of a different track, but it's very much the same general idea, I guess. I, I was just curious for VHS, do you have, um, like, I guess I, what I'm asking is, what exactly is your strategy when you look at digitizing uh, materials going into the future? I mean, do you have a system whereby, for example, um, if you find that there's a frequent demand for a particular set of documents or a subject area or something, you prioritize that? Or is it more about the accessibility of the different documents or their condition? Just curious about the planning for that. Well, I'm not sure that we have the most uh, uh, well-developed master plan in that regard, um, Alexander, but um, it does tend to be, uh, well, it really depends on the type of material that you're talking about. And um, uh, it does generally tend to be based on use and demand. Um, so, if you're talking about things like um, our journal articles, 
for instance. Um, with those we digitize on demand. So the back issues of Vermont history and the, the, preceding, uh, the proceedings of the Vermont Historical Society, those that you see online are based on requests for them. Right. Um, there have been sometimes like with the Civil War, we did a um, sort of a retrospective scan for the, uh, the anniversary that just happened. Um, Photographs tends to be more project-based, tends to be more um, photographer-based. If we have a uh, set of uh, images by a particular photographer that we think would be useful um, to the public, we make sort of a judgment call on that. Mm -hmm. um, we, do scan, um, we do scan images uh, on demand and get them out to people for their various projects, but those don't necessarily um, make their way onto a public database. Um, right. <clears throat> so um, we are building up a, um, uh, a collection of these digital images, um, but uh, a lot of that has been done sort of to satisfy the, uh, the immediate needs uh, of, of users, which can get in the way of uh, developing a nice, um, mm -hmm. well-organized and well-cataloged database. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's enough of an answer, but- um, It's, it's we're, a big we're, challenge. We're, we're a relatively small organization too. Um, so um, we're sort of all in the same boat. Um, we don't have the, the staff that we, uh, we would like. I mean, if we had a digital, uh, digital librarian, um, that would be great. Mm. Someone could really uh, ride herd on, um, on setting up priorities and maybe bringing some of the um, assets that we've created out into the public. Um, but unfortunately we're doing, uh, doing many things so, um, I, yeah. I, I was, I know there's a lot more, fun. I'll, I'll just say this real quick. I know that the, I learned recently the Army uh, Heritage and Education Center down in Carlisle in Pennsylvania, they contracted, I don't know the name of the contractor, but they hired an outside company to do a digitization project to try and digitize. It sounds like a pretty hefty proportion of their collection and it's, um, very expensive contract, I mean, in the millions of dollars, of course, but the idea is to try and get the vast quantity of this stuff online. And I wonder, um, I mean, obviously, you know, funding is always the key question here because that, that's, that was pretty big enterprise, but I wonder if on a smaller scale, some limited work in that vein might help in the future. Just, just an idea, I don't know how feasible to are you. Are you talking about documents now? Yeah. Letters, yeah. diaries? You like know, that? Letter, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the big, that's, that's a big challenge for us is to try to figure out what would be worth our time to digitize. Uh, so the uh, images are really the low hanging fruit of this whole enterprise. Um, and I can see, I could see doing some, um, some early documents. Uh, we've got some early documents that need some conservation. We could have those digitized at the same time. But after that, you know, um, how to choose one family collection over another is um, really sort of mind boggling. Um, if, um, you know, if you were in a town that had a particular um, business that was um, uh, particularly important in the town, I could see um, uh, prioritizing that. Although boy, getting into uh, business records, um, you know, there, there are so many account books. Uh, is it really worth digitizing each and every page of each and every account book? Um, you'd have to make a pretty, pretty strong argument that that's, uh, that that's worth your time. Um, something like, I mean, going a full circle now, something like, um, uh, yearbooks has a much broader audience. Um, you know, sure. everyone in town yeah. who went to high school wants to see that yearbook or wants to see grandpa's yearbook and wants to see multiple pages in that yearbook. Um, but, you know, the, uh, the casket factory um, that uh, existed for, uh, you know, 50 years, um, do you want to digitize it all? Um, that's a all real, right. that's a real tough question. Let's see. Someone suggests a scanning day at the VHS. 
Yes, actually, we were thinking right before the uh, COVID hit, we were uh, thinking of doing a scanning day. We'd actually planned, we had scheduled a uh, scanning day for uh, glass plate negatives that we had. We had a large collection of a photographer by the name of Bosworth, um, and we were going to uh, set up and um, get some people in and um, uh, thought it would be a fun project. Uh, but that obviously got canceled. Um, before COVID, has anyone done a um, project where you um, uh, set volunteers down? And I'm sure, I'm sure local societies have have done this, either a glass plate negative collection or uh, the, the the physical files, um, or do you just sort of chip away at it as you as you go? <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> chip, chip, chip. Okay. And yes, someone posted about don't buy a, a, a scanning bed that's too small. Um, that's a very good point. Uh, 11 by 17 is, um, you can get 11 by 17 uh, consumer or nice consumer grade scanners. Uh, very useful for doing uh, newspapers or broadsides. I mean, that's a whole nother topic we haven't talked about, broadsides. Um, I would think that would be a low hanging fruit. Um, Fred's holding up the uh, Times Argus. <laughs> um, that's obviously gonna be bigger than 11 by 17, but, um, uh, and the same holds true with uh, glass plate negatives. Not all um, transparency scanners are the same size. Uh, you do have to stretch a little bit for, um, a transparency scanner that will handle eight by 10. For a long time, we didn't have that. So we've got a lot of scans that are narrower than the full plate, which isn't really the end of the world um, as and not as bad as you might think, since when you look at your typical glass plate negative, there's a lot of sky in there. Um, so it does change the proportions of the original view if you're not scanning the whole thing. But as far as the historical data goes, um, you're really not losing a lot if you only have a scanner that does a, um, a narrower band. Uh, we now do, there are um, transparency scanners that'll handle eight by 10. Uh, we now thankfully do have that thanks to a donor, but, um, for a long time, a lot of our scans are sort of limited in their, their size. Let's see. Oh, yes, a document camera. That would be very cool. Um, and there are, um, there are copy machines um, now that have uh, overhead uh, cameras that make um, PDFs. Uh, I know that uh, UVM certainly has those. I don't know if uh, Champlain College where Erica works does, but um, that's, um, that's a, a quick way to, uh, to get a PDF done of a, uh, of a book of a bound item uh, that you don't want to put down flat against the scanner. Um, and uh, yeah, it's something we haven't invested in, but it's probably something we need to do fairly soon because I, I suspect as they are more uh, common uh, that the prices are gonna come down. Um, and it'd be nice to have one, I, I could imagine, and now I'm just talking off the top of my head with, with no authority whatsoever, but um, it'd be really nice to have one uh, here at the History Center or maybe in a couple of places around the state um, where local societies could bring things. Because it's certainly not something that a local society wants to invest in, but um, I could see a, um, a decentralized uh, way of um, putting things out there for people to scan um, fragile items that they don't want to put on a, on a flatbed. So anyone else have any burning questions or suggestions or um, experiences on how you did a really great digital project that you want to mention before we uh, sign off here? Someone is just entering and I'll, I'll let her in, but uh, we're just uh, starting to wrap up here. Maybe she thought it started at, at one o'clock. So Eileen, are you going to capture this um, 
this chat? Is that possible? Or have you been taking pieces of it? Uh, yes. So um, everyone, I will be, along with the recording, I am saving the chat and I'll be sending out sort of a, what I'd call an edited version of it. Uh, so using the, you know, the links and then sort of, of putting together um, the information that people shared. Um, you're also welcome. You should also be able to save the chat yourself um, if you want the full thing uh, about what's been talked about today. But I'll be sending that out along with a link to the recording, um, hopefully shortly. So uh, yeah, I'd say thank you all for coming. Um, again, what we can, you know, a little quick hits of everything we could talk about in an hour. Uh, so it's always great to, to see folks. And I, we hope again, we can different topics to talk about for the next two roundtables, but hope some of you will join us for those. Um, and again, I think definitely some of these digital, digitization projects and, and sort of consortial and group work is something that, that's gonna get, gonna be coming back around in the next couple of years for, for many of us. And so uh, look forward to hopefully having more discussions on that.